Thank you, Vania. Thank you for those kind words. And starting with this very difficult and touchy subject, I would like to give you a word of caution. If any of you is thinking of a beautiful international tax scheme, please don't put it on paper because I would have then to report you to the Belgian tax authorities. And uh, of course, I would claim professional secrecy. Everything we say today is confidential. But if I don't do it, Vanya would have to do it. And if she doesn't, you would have to do it yourself. So why? And that's the, that's the point. Let us look at uh, DAC 6, this very strange piece of legislation, which is really a new event in, uh, in the tax world and in the legal world. Uh, a new event, to be honest, this type of legislation existed already in, in various countries. It existed in the United States, uh, you know, the, the mandatory reporting to the IRS of, uh, of the, some tax schemes. It existed in Canada and it existed in the UK uh, uh, and also in some other countries, which you see on the screen. Now, uh, all this took momentum with um, Action 12 of BEPS, which, uh, you know, of course, you all of you know BEPS. Action 12 is uh, deals with uh, mandatory uh, reporting. Um, action 12 was, of course, an action of BEPS, uh, so of the OECD with uh, its mandate from the G20. But then uh, the European Union thought that it was good to issue a directive putting Action 12 of BEPS into application to have the same type of application in all uh, member states of the European Union. And that's where our directive comes from. And our directive has been you now implemented by national law in almost all of the European uh, countries. So you'll be able to read your own statute. And I have, of course, uh, read uh, everything about the Belgian statute, the French statute, uh, the German statute. There have been many commentaries in Germany, especially in that very good law review, Internationale Steuerrecht. Now, uh, let's jump into the directive. So we shall follow the text of the directive, which you can, of course, find uh, on all websites. Uh, and you have also uh, uh, the slides and a small outline uh, uh, about the contents of the directive. Which are the taxes covered by the directive? Well, all taxes, so corporate tax, of course, but also, and my slide is a little bit wrong, you see at the end, inheritance duty, registration tax, those are covered also. So uh, you would, uh, uh, very strange taxes, including miscellaneous taxes, which could be covered. What is not covered, the VAT, customs duties, excise, uh, and social security, insofar as you can consider uh, social security to be a tax. Okay. First remark, this is of a much wider scope than ATAD, the Anti-Tax Avoidance Directive, uh, which we also know, and uh, because at that uh, is concerned only with corporation taxes. And you will see that the directive, or directive, DAC 6, uh, doesn't fit very well with other taxes than uh, corporate taxes or eventually uh, individual taxes. So what will be the essence of this? directive, the essence will be that any intermediary 
has to report to its tax authorities some types of arrangements, arrangements meeting some hallmarks, some characteristics, and once they are disclosed to the national tax authority, the national tax authority must report them to any other tax authority uh, in uh, the European Union, which is concerned by the scheme, by the arrangement. What is strange here? Well, you, you will see that it is the first time, I think, in uh, European legislation, and even in any legislation, that something which is in the mind of a lawyer or an accountant, which is put on paper by him and eventually disclosed confidentially to a client, has to be reported. We all know that under the money laundering law, uh, we have to report, but we have to report things which have happened uh, that we believe, we, we suspect that uh, money laundering is present in the action of a client. Uh, and we must do that only when we exceed in some way or normal uh, party or normal uh, role as a lawyer, uh, which is advising and uh, litigating uh, when we take part into financial transactions or things like that. So that's understandable. Uh, but here, what we are talking about may be perfectly licit, valid, legal arrangements, but we have to report them. So we shall see in succession what an arrangement is, what the hallmarks are, and what and who is an intermediary. What is an arrangement? strange word, very wide meaning, of course. In French, it is dispositif. In German, gestaltung. Uh, the directive does not define what an arrangement is. First difficulty. Uh, in the recitals to the directive, you see, you, you will read that an arrangement is something which is developed across various tax jurisdictions to move taxable profits towards more beneficial uh, tax regimes than the original tax regime, or which have the effect of reducing the taxpayers' overall tax liability. Even if the cross-border result is not the main purpose of the arrangement. But of course, the cross-border outcome must be set forth, described with a high degree of specificity. So this is very general. Uh, and the justification for this lack of a definition is that it cannot be defined, that giving a definition would be to narrow, would narrow the scope of the directive. In the BEPS Action 12 report, you will read that it is any arrangement involving a domestic taxpayer if the arrangement includes a cross-border outcome. And that will cover any scheme, plan, or even an understanding which is not a formal contract, all the steps and transactions of the arrangement and all the persons, not only who are party to the arrangement, but who are affected by the arrangement. 
Let's take some examples. Uh, Pierre Larousse, the author of the dictionary, used to say that a dictionary without examples is a skeleton. Uh, so Vanya will give you more examples uh, in, in her speech. But what is an arrangement? For instance, uh, group financing. You introduce new capital into the group. And then all subsequent steps of the group financing, uh, intra-group transactions, uh, transaction taken in contemplation of the financing or as a consequence of the financing if it has a cross-border outcome and if it reduces the taxes of the taxpayer. So each time you increase the capital of a subsidiary in a group, you will, you will be worried and see whether you have to report or not. The acquisition of a new entity in the group, the acquisition itself, the financing of the acquisition, any post-acquisition restructuring, all that will be covered provided there is a cross-border outcome. So once you have made a cross-border arrangement, you are supposed to report it if you are an intermediary. So prima facie, if a company has taken advice, the company itself does not have to report. It is the intermediary who has to report. Uh, So this cross-border arrangement must have a cross-border outcome. It must concern more than one member state or a member state and a third country when the participants, and we shall see what is meant by participant, don't reside in the same jurisdiction or one participant resides in two jurisdictions at the same time or the arrangement is part of the business of a permanent establishment in another jurisdiction, or even if a participant exercises an activity in another jurisdiction without having a PE. So if you have in your cross-border arrangement, somebody who says, oh, I'm working in Spain, or oh, you are working in Spain, let's see whether there is not a tax benefit there. And then a second type of uh, arrangement which is covered is any arrangement which has consequences on the automatic exchange of information or on the identification of the effective beneficiary of uh, an entity. Very wide. What is a participant? Well, it's not defined. So again, I look at the, the, the domestic statutes and we already see that the domestic statutes are uh, in some ways different. In France, uh, the participants will be, of course, the relevant taxpayer, the taxpayer who is concerned, all its associated enterprises, all intermediaries concerned, and that in my opinion is wrong, uh, any person susceptible to be concerned by the arrangement and the entity itself, which may not be right either. In Germany, it's different. It is the user of the arrangement, his enterprise and his contract partners. This is much more limited. In Belgium, you read that an intermediary who is not active in the arrangement is not a participant. I'm the lawyer, I give an advice, and then I close my file and I go to play tennis. Uh, okay, uh, well, uh, uh, I'm not active in the arrangement, I'm not a participant. Uh, but if I become a director of a company which is part of the arrangement, then I am a participant. The bank 
which grants the credit is not a participant. Cross border. So domestic arrangements are not concerned. You may still make a wonderful arrangement between uh, Lombardia and Sicily uh, uh, to avoid some local taxes. That's not to be reported. In some countries, they've extended the reporting to uh, domestic arrangements, uh, Ireland, uh, Portugal, uh, and Sweden, uh, which will do the same. Uh, participation, participants, again, examples. You merge two foreign subsidiaries, and you have a parent. Is the parent a participant? Yes, because he votes. A subsidiary of the parent sells a participation in another subsidiary, and both subsidiaries are located in Italy. <coughs> Is the parent a participant? No. The whole thing happens in Italy between Italian companies. I make a loan to another Belgian businessman who has a foreign permanent establishment. If he uses the loan in Belgium, it's not reportable. If he uses the loan in his permanent establishment abroad, it is reportable. You see, it is extremely wide. What about transparent entities? I am a participant in a transparent entity. In Belgium, this entity is considered as a legal entity, but in Germany, it is considered as transparent. Is it cross-border? Well, I don't have the answer, and I don't want to commit myself before having a, a touchy case <laughs> to argue. Uh, a cross-border arrangement is an arrangement only if it meets one of the hallmarks. So this is exactly what we've learned at school not to do. Uh, instead of defining something, uh, citing all the details, the characteristics of the concept, and then saying, well, that's it. Uh, the intermediary doesn't have to make research. Uh, a reasonable person must consider the arrangement and say, well, this meets one of the hallmarks. No, the hallmarks are the important thing in this directive. Uh, you have some hallmarks which are linked to the main benefit test. So the main purpose of the arrangement is to get a tax benefit. And you have some other hallmarks which are so damnable that their hallmarks by themselves whether you look for a tax benefit or not. So let us first have a look at the general hallmarks. The general hallmarks are the following. If you write to your client, this is strictly confidential, well, it's reportable. So never write that. Just look at the law. Of course, everything which a lawyer writes to his client is confidential, but don't write it. Second, you make your fee depend on the result, the beneficial result tax-wise of the arrangement, reportable. You devise a standardized documentation, reportable. You say, hey, I have a very good scheme and you can use it, uh, uh, all of you, without uh, many uh, modifications. What about the advice given to a client 
to all your clients, well, let's wait five years before you make a capital gain, because after five years, it's not going to be taxable anymore. Is that a standardized documentation? Or is it just the application of the law? Well, I think it's just the application of the law, but you, ne you, you never know. Uh, you make uh, a, a benefits plan for companies. Uh, and uh, thanks to the, uh, the subscription of shares, your workers will be able to transform wages into capital gains. Is that a standardized documentation? Or is it just the application of the law? Question mark. I leave all the difficult questions to Vanya. Huh? Uh, I just uh, put the question marks. Um, then we move to the specific hallmarks. Specific hallmarks, and some of those are linked also to the main benefit test. You must look for a tax benefit. The first one is the acquisition of a loss-making company in order to use the losses to cancel profits. An old story. Uh, in almost all of the national statute, uh, uh, this is uh, without any effect. But OK, OK. Then second specific hallmark, you convert income into capital, into gifts, or into income taxed at a lower rate. You say to your client, well, don't distribute dividends before you sell your company. Dividends will be highly taxed, uh, whereas your capital gain, if you sell your company, will be taxed at a lower rate. Is that reportable? But, well, <laughs> you've transformed, uh, by your advice, uh, dividend income into capital gains. It depends, I think, on whether your client intended to distribute dividends. Uh, examples, uh, the transformation of income. You contribute a loan to a subsidiary. You will receive dividends instead of interest, and you will enjoy the participation exemption. That's certainly reportable. You have 9% of a company, and you acquire an additional 1% to benefit from the parent subsidiary directive uh, and to avoid the withholding tax. And you have no economic reason to buy that 1%. Is it reportable? Question mark. A third type of reportable transaction, a circular transaction, of course. That's the old story of the English case law, you know. Uh, uh, you sell uh, shares to company A, which sells them to company B, which sells them to company C in the Isle of Man. And finally, uh, they are sold back uh, to, to the original seller. Well, uh, OK, that's a round tripping. It's circular. Uh, but what about a sale and lease back? What about cash pooling? What about a contribution to the capital of a subsidiary which has no activity whatsoever? What about the grant of a license in order to decrease your own profit because it is your foreign associate uh, which is going to get the royalty and so your, your, your uh, business profit will be reduced? All that uh, can be considered to fall within circular transactions if, again, the characteristics are met. Then you have specific hallmarks which are related to the cross-border transaction, even if there is no tax benefit. And let's look at those hallmarks and make the distinction. First, hallmarks through which you get a deduction because you make a payment and that payment goes to, goes to some uh, suspect recipients which are not residing in any tax jurisdiction. That reminds you of the Apple case uh, in Ireland. Uh, we didn't know whether those recipients were 
uh, resident in Ireland or in the United States. In fact, they were residing nowhere. Uh, well, nevertheless, uh, the Apple case was won so far, but there is an appeal. Um, recipients residing in low tax jurisdictions or in non cooperative jurisdictions, according to the OECD list. Um, if there is no tax, there must be a main benefit attached to the scheme. There is a tax exemption in the recipient jurisdiction, again, main benefit. There is a preferential tax regime in the recipient jurisdiction, main advantage. It means that if you are using, for instance, the deduction for patents, uh, innovation, uh, etc., only because it's the law in a country, but you don't get a tax benefit, why don't you get it? Well, maybe because the regime exists in your own country also, then it's not reportable. But if you look carefully all over the world, all over Europe, to, to, to get that tax benefit, which you don't enjoy otherwise, then it might be reportable because you are looking for a, a tax benefit. Of course, you have also the depreciation of the same asset in various jurisdictions, a relief for double taxation, which is requested in various jurisdictions, and a transfer of assets with a material difference in consideration. You have bought your asset at a high price, you sell it to an affiliate at a low price. All those are reportable transactions. And then you have another type of specific hallmarks which concern information exchange or the identification of beneficial owners. You devise any type of scheme to avoid the compulsory reporting under DAX 1 to DAX, to DAX 5. For instance, very simple, you convert your dematerialized shares which are in an account into nominative shares. And so you avoid the reporting. Well, I think of that because the government in Belgium is just planning to introduce a wealth tax on bank accounts. Uh, on bank accounts where you have put securities. And it has announced that there will be an anti-abuse provision say, stating if you convert your shares into nominative shares, well, uh, it will be considered an abuse. Okay, you see the difference between the provision. It's an abuse. It's an abuse. But the government will know about the abuse because the lawyer who advises that to his client has to report it. So <laughs> it's not a post factum reporting, it's a pre a pre reporting. Beneficial owner, well, it's the old story through a very complex chain of companies, you hide the real beneficial owner, you make a trust, and you say the benefits, the benefits of the trust go to the Red Cross. Yes, okay, the Red Cross, but uh, there is a first beneficiary, which is not the Red Cross, but which is uh, another person. And you do that through a chain of, of, uh, of companies uh, uh, that has to be reported. And then finally, you have the transfer pricing hallmarks. Very strange. You look for a safe harbor regime. You know, we have many of those in the United States, for instance or in Germany, you say, you, uh, you apply the, 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 the principles for multinational companies about transfer pricing, and you say, well, my interest will be 5%, well, 5% is all right, it's a safe harbor. Okay, okay, 
reportable. It's perfectly legal, but it's reportable. You transfer intangibles, which are, which are hard to value. What is an intangible which is hard to value? Well, prophecies are difficult to make, especially when they concern the future, uh, said somebody. <laughs> when you say, well, how much will it raise as income in the future? You don't know. Ah, you don't know? Reportable. You transfer cross-border functions, risks, or assets. That reminds you of the, of the beautiful OECD report on permanent establishments, so functions, risks, assets. And after you've made that, you see that your uh, EBIT, your earnings before interest and taxes, uh, are lower by at least 50%. Well, okay, it's reportable. It's reportable even if the transfer has been perfectly legal, you have really transferred the persons or the assets. Okay, now let's look at ourselves. We are intermediaries. Are we intermediaries? Well, an intermediary, it is any person who designs, market, organizes, makes available for implementation, manages the implementation of a reportable cross-border arrangement. That's the main intermediary. But then you have a, a, the secondary intermediary, as they call him in, in the German doctrine. It is any person <clears throat> who knows that is used in a scheme to give an opinion, even an opinion on a point of detail, that's the auxiliary intermediary. Design. Well, one of those good tax IDs, which maybe you have had already, well, you are the designer. You are an intermediary. You market it. I've heard, after the speech of Vanya, I think one of her schemes is extremely interesting. Well, I will market it for myself uh, and uh, 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 advise uh, a client to use it. Uh, well, I am marketing Vanya's scheme. Uh, organizing. I am a general practitioner. I don't know anything about tax, but I consult a tax lawyer to make a scheme. I organize. I make available for implementation. Well, I use the scheme of somebody else and I make it available for implementation and manage the implementation. Well, I have the guy who is in Italy and is moving uh, the permanent establishment from Germany to Italy. Uh, he hires personnel, he, he, he uh, looks for premises and he knows the tax purpose. Well, he is an intermediary. And the auxiliary intermediary is that guy who gives a second opinion, but adds something to the scheme. If he just gives a second opinion, I'm not sure of my scheme. And I ask Vanya, what do you think of that scheme? And she says, you are perfectly right. A tax will be saved. Okay, she didn't add anything. She doesn't have to report, I have to report. And of course the intermediary will be connected in some way to uh, uh, the, uh, the European uh, Union. For instance, if he is registered with a professional association, an American lawyer who is at the same time a member of the Brussels Bar, there are many. Well, uh, there are uh, intermediaries. What is the information? The information is the full identification of the scheme of the taxpayer. You must give the name, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. What about professional secrecy? Ah, lawyers, accountants, many professions. Bankers generally don't have professional secrecy. They have a duty of discretion. Well, it is a system which is very ingenious. A lawyer, for instance, 
may claim professional secrecy. And he says to his client, I'm not going to report. But then the client has to report or before the client, another intermediary. So if there is a banker involved in the scheme, he's an intermediary, he knows everything, he has to report. And the question is, of course, is this in conformity with the professional secrecy? Well, many lawyers think that it is not, and several uh, appeals have been filed to the constitutional courts in Belgium. There are already several appeals asking also the constitutional court to put a preliminary question to the European court because professional secrecy is a general principle recognized under the Charter of Fundamental Rights. So we shall see what the success or the failure will be of those uh, appeals. Time period, it is retroactive because you have to report all the schemes which you have implemented since June 2018. So look into your old files. Now, due to COVID, uh, generally, for instance, in Belgium, the application of the directive has been deferred to next year. Uh, but starting January 1st, one has to report. And starting in February, you have to report the old schemes. Now, of course, you will wonder whether all this is really in conformity with European law, with the fundamental rights of the taxpayer. We are not here really to criticize the directive, but to describe it so that you know what you have to do. But you must take into account that your situation may be extremely difficult under, under professional secrecy. So some people have said, this is not <coughs> in conformity with European law, because look at Article 113 or Article 115 of the Treaty for the Functioning of the European Union. This is not necessary to ensure the functioning of the internal market. This is not a harmonization of tax law, which is provided for in the treaty. Uh, really, every country remains free to decide what it wants to do in that respect. Because what is the purpose of the directive? The idea is the tax administration is not, does not have the necessary means to think of all those schemes which the lawyers or accountants are going to devise. First, is that true? I think that members of the tax administration are extremely clever, and maybe more clever than we are, and that they know the practice very well. If a scheme is tolerated in a country, it is generally because uh, the tax administration or the government has decided not to change the law, and otherwise they change the law. We know that most of the, uh, of the uh, tax schemes are covered by specific legislation. Also, the common market, the internal market, has as purpose the free movement, the free movement. And here, Whenever there is a free movement, you have to report. Is that in conformity with the treaty? Which is really the purpose of this legislation? The purpose is to identify loopholes. And in England, they have closed several loopholes after disclosure. But also, the purpose of DAC6 is to deter taxpayers from using those schemes because they will be reported. And so the taxpayer may, of course, expect a request for information, to say the least, or 
a new deed. Um, is there a justification? Tax avoidance, but legal tax avoidance, so not tax evasion, tax avoidance. Is it a justification? Um, the freedoms, uh, sometimes a double deduction, for instance. Well, that may be against the balanced allocation of taxing rights. Uh, but maybe, maybe. Um, tax avoidance, limited by the Cadbury Schweppes case to wholly artificial arrangements. But here, maybe your arrangement is not artificial. And then a very difficult question, what about your rights, the fundamental rights, the protection of personal data, um, the access to a judge or to the administration? You may not apply for a ruling before disclosing. You would like to know, Here, here's my scheme. Must I report or not? I don't know. May I ask the, the administration? No, you must report. And then, then you may apply for a ruling if you want to implement your scheme. But a ruling is confidential, whereas the disclosure, of course, is not confidential. The gist of the matter is, is all this really proportional? Proportion, proportionate with the goal of the directive. Conclusion. The real question is whether such a piece of legislation is admissible in our legal civilization, I would say. So that that you, of course, may be accountable for things which you have done, which you have implemented. That's perfectly normal. But this is the first time in legislation that an idea, an opinion given by a, an expert must be disclosed even before it has been put in application, and even if it, did not, if it is not put into application. Whereas under money laundering law, if a scheme is not put into application, then, and there is a recent judgment on that, you don't have to report. So this is a question, and I'm sure that you may have many questions uh, many questions to uh, in that respect, uh, and that Vanya will give you uh, many uh, examples which are also going to raise questions. And now, Daniel, Vanya, I think it's time to open the question time if, if, if there are questions or remarks.